Well, anyway, yeah, let me just start with that. I guess the uh, <clears throat> I'm Derek Tapaska, been a member of uh, First Church to my surprise since 2001. Um, that's dated, it's, it's sort of unfortunately dated in my head because I had just come over, we, our family had just come over from All Saints. And that, that Sunday um, of 9, nine uh, 10, no, nine, it would have been 9, 9, uh, a young fellow who, one of the, who died in the uh, uh, terrorist you know, attacks uh, on 9-11, on uh, had just come over from the church as well and sat in the same pew and noticed, oh, you know. So anyway, but then um, to my sort of my surprise, a lot of the parents of my daughter's cohort uh, drifted away and um, I stayed there sitting in the back row, not getting involved, keeping my aesthetic distance and keeping my and leg room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so weirdly enough, I mean, I'd... Um, I've become much more involved with the church and feel much more connected to the church since the, since the pandemic happened. Never went to coffee hour. Almost had perfect attendance in coffee hour online, you know. So um, it's been a good thing, you know. And I've, I've as, as the notes, if any of you read them, or whether you just come to this thing, whether, whether you, anyway, um, I retired from teaching at Framingham State two years ago. Perfect, I sort of serendipitous my way into teaching and I serendipit my way out in that I'd been planning to retire for three years, but it happened to be in the spring of 2020 when the last course I ever taught, which was called the creative process, um, the second half of my 64th semester wound up on Zoom. Yeah. But gratefully, I at least had gotten to know the kids, a great bunch of people, most primarily, I think, because they're almost all women. And we sort of gotten to know each other for the first half of the semester. So when we had to go to this virtual thing, we at least had a sense of each other, you know. So it was, it was one of the best experiences I'd had in teaching that class, uh, about a dozen times. So, uh, so I, I was, I was able to keep myself out of the fray and and safe and quarantine. And my domestic partner lives in Santa Monica, California, and um, so I was, you know, used to being here and going about my business, and and man, and you know, lucky to be able to stay out of. Um, arms way as much as I chose. So anyway, so during that during that year, and, and I guess Nicole, you browbeat me into doing this today. Um, so you have heard of blame if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't get enough, if this isn't enough for you today, um, there's a, if there's a good interview with me on uh, Zoom, on um, YouTube, uh, just type in my name and they it was a, a, an organization I'm very fond of and my, my oldest friend started it in the 70s called Alternatives Unlimited, and they did a series called From Valleycast, and they came and did an interview about a year and a half ago. So you see me sitting out in the garage with my wood and whatever. So, uh, But anyway, but during, during last year, a lot of it was just shuffling old stuff around, but I was in 12 exhibitions last year, and I ranged from online to... Um, um, other, you know, more prestigious stuff. I had I'd never known Attleboro had an art museum, let alone, you know, been there. And I was in, I think, three exhibitions there last year, an invitational one, a national competition and one, and so on. So anyway, and um, had three exhibitions so far this year. One of them still going on in Newport, and then there's one coming up in Marblehead, maybe on the Cape, so we'll see. Anyway, let's talk about some stuff. So if we go, if I go to share a screen, Mark, keep me honest here, All right? Or do I, babe, or do I just go to? Um, yeah, click share screen bot bottom. Yep. Okay. Perfect. There. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, this this title was just changed yesterday because this was the title slide for a talk I gave at the university um, several years ago. Then I've added to this and rearranged things and so on. But it was it was called because uh, I was a, a professor and often I, I was one of those rare people who liked being chair of the department. So I was chair of the department for 19 of 32 years. But um, and somewhere along the line, I uh, I managed to convince them to let me submit port, uh, portfolios of artwork rather than academic papers to get promoted and so on and so on. So 
Um, but the question was always what, why getting why this ex media now ex media professor loved his chainsaw. Yeah. And I love that title as a snappy title. It wasn't um, exactly true. I don't really love my chainsaw, but I have a lot of respect for it. And that's so that's my chainsaw in my backyard. And that's a, a piece of uh, uh, I don't know if you're hearing noise. That's my boiler work being done. Uh, that's a big piece of oak burl. About 99% of my wood that I've used in the last 20, 30 years has been free. We have our sources. Um, and most recently, it's a place called Community Tree up in Billerica, and they put stuff aside for us, and we give them pieces now and again. And so that's an amazing sort of 30-some inch diameter burl. And um, anyway, so the chainsaw is, is fundamental in sort of getting started with this. But anyway, so that piece, um, there's a piece made from that burl. Uh, and that piece happily in one of the nicest associations, that piece is now in the uh, art collection of the uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute downtown. It's, a big, it's about 20 inches in diameter. And the nice thing is well, a former student of mine got a job working in PR at, uh, at, the, at the Cancer Institute. And she emailed me to say that she'd seen my piece. It's in a case right in the front, right in the front desk. And I said, "Ooh, it, they've moved it. It used to be up in the pharmacy." And so, anyway, they bought it at a, at a sale at the museum school many years ago. But so that this, the chainsaw went to work on that piece, and then it got onto the lathe eventually. And sometimes you don't even need the lathe. That piece for, that was a friend and I, Dietrich, my dear friend, a cowboy who loves hunting wood more than working with it. This is, we were climbed up on a pile of stuff at the, uh, at, in Bill Rick at the tree place and cut this chunk of, of um, oak burl and it just rolled down the, and that was it, you know? And so I just treated the forms, it's called tetrahedron, three sides and it's about 21 inches tall and it's in degrees of finish as you move around the piece or something. So uh, sometime all you needed was a chainsaw. Anyway, but I don't want to tell you about my entire childhood, but this is the oldest known uh, Tapasco work of art in wood. And I just happened to have it here too. <laughs> and that somehow I found it when my mom died 25 years ago, we we're tidying up. I found a, a, a walnut platter that I made in shop class, a real clunker. And this piece, which was dated on the bottom 1945, not 1455, my students would think, and it looks like it's signed on the back and you can tell that I, um, I didn't know how to sharpen a knife very well and I got bored easily because on the back it's just sort of doodles, you know. But anyway, that was, um, it was made for Cub Scouts in 1955. And the whole thing about getting physical, I don't want to belabor that when I would show this picture to people and or show the, the piece of wood to, uh, to people and ask them and tell them, it's a trick question, I won't belabor it, but um, is, um, I'd say this, this object represents something very specific. What is it? And students would, and I'd pass it around the room and so on. And students would, you know, sort of say, well, it looks like a dinosaur egg, or it looks like this, or it looks like that. It's about 10 inches tall, something like that. And it, the trick question was, is that what, and I said that, you know, lots of other things could represent, is as be represented of what I'm, this represents as well, but and no one ever thought it had anything to do with its physicality. They would think it had to do with its shape, with its color, with its condition, whatever. And it turns out it's all about its weight. It weighs exactly three pounds. And I once modified it to add weight to the bottom when it dried. It weighs three pounds, which is the average weight of the human brain. So this whole question of getting physical, they would never occur to my students in particular, even if I handed it around, especially now we're so used to seeing images, we don't think of them as being really physical, you know, that somehow the image is the equivalent of the object and it's obviously not when it comes to wood. So anyway, so, and there's where the magic happens <laughs> as well as the mess. Um, you can almost see the, the boiler in the back where the, it's now been replaced. Anyway, that's in my basement here in Belmont. Um, I am not on the edge of Belmont. I am the edge. Across the street is Arlington over here on Lake Street. And that's, um, that's a big, that's the machine that dominates my work. And I hate to have it completely dominated. I do other things differently. You can see there's a bandsaw in the back and a, and a um, 
uh, drill press and so on. There's some other tools around, but that's a big powerful machine called a stubby lathe. that's meant to make pieces like this rather than baseball bats or balusters. People think you do, that's what a lathe is if they know what a lathe is where you make spindle stuff, but I, I almost never do that. And this isn't, a, you could, the tallest thing I could make would be 34 inches and up to about 16 inches in diameter. And this is in the process of making, it, in other words, you take a big piece of log and you put it on the lathe and then it turns around real fast and you stick a sharp object into it. And if you're lucky, things happen that, that, that work out. It's like sticking your fingers in the fan. It's just more productive, we hope. But, Anyway, so that's the, that's the basement. And it usually looks sort of like that. Because one of the physicality, the problems with wood is that wood cracks. And so, you know, that's the bane of the existence for lots of wood workers and wood turners. So this is just, there's a series of stuff I call desperate measures and they're just spoofing the idea of you just abandon hope and try to, you know, people, this was actually published in a magazine, the American Wood Turner about when, when good wood cracks, various things people try to do to compensate, you know, lace it together or fill it with stuff or whatever. Anyway, this was the first one called bolt head. Then there was one done with landscaping spikes. These are hollow pieces I turned and then just threw them outside during the winter and then they cracked open and I hollowed them out and so on. There's spikes, there's one with straps. The irony here is that the straps as the wood changes as it continues to do, uh, the straps would tend to fall off. So these actually have drill, little drill, drilled holes in them. So they're pinned into place so they won't fall off. Yeah. And I've resumed this, this series just recently and we'll get to that later. So anyway. Oh, and there's another one called Turnbuckles. That's in a private collection somewhere. And then also, you know, after you've done a bit of wood, you know, soon you want to do stuff to the surface. And I don't, this my dear friend, Dennis, he said, Derek, you make beautiful things and then you cover them with crap, like the next one or this one. You know, this has just got, uh, this piece actually was, it's about 18 inches in diameter. It has a rosewood rim around it and it's made of wood. And when I was making it, hollowing out the inside, I put a hole in it from the inside, you know, where it cut it too thin. So I just I thought, what could I do to cover that? And I found some stuff called modeling paste. People, acrylic painters use it to thicken their paint. And I just smeared it on the pot and that would work. And so now that this piece was on the lathe and it was then it was almost like ceramics. You could just take this glop, you know, like, you, you know, um, icing a cake and let it turn. And then you'd, because actually in Middle English, I think the word to, uh, to throw used to mean, it could mean either to make on the lathe or to turn, either to throw on the potter's wheel or to turn on the lathe. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's got that surface. And then you can put one color on and stain over it and then sand it back and reveal the color onto it. So something like this, <clears throat> this is called AP Red Number One. They wanted a title, so I gave it a pretentious one. It really stands for Acrylic Polymer Red Number One. The others had been different colors. This is actually, to my very happy surprise or pleasure, is in the permanent collection of the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. I'd sold it to a very wealthy collector who gave a bunch of stuff to them a few years ago. And so that, that was really, this piece was made, uh, there are people who could hollow that. This is really two very shallow bowls sort of, you know, um, uh, glued together and then covered with, as Dennis would say, crap, modeling paste. And then you got to, you know, the wood is very beautiful. One of the worst things you can say to a wood turner is that, oh, that's a really pretty piece of wood. You know, if there's, if there's, because the, the truth is, you get a really pretty piece of wood, and a lot of people can make a really pretty bowl pretty quickly, you know. And this happens to be a big, beautiful piece of walnut, and maybe that was maybe 16 inches tall. And, um, well, the secret is, by the way, it used to, it was going to be a hollow form, and I tore the top off. So what do you do? Well, if you give lemons, you make lemonade. I just put a rim around it. I gave it a pretentious title called Crater with a K, which refers to an ancient Greek form of a punch bowl, basically, and put dots all over it. And I sold it for a fair amount of money. <laughs> so actually to a trustee of the, of the Fuller Museum. So, so this was putting, so then I, I was doing a lot of this stuff and it's, um, and they got to know, and I was doing things called pots with dots, at least my colleagues would call it that. So Derek did pots with dots, 
with a wood burner. By the way, that reason, another reason I show you that that the the, the um, little uh, totem pole is that it was uh, this is these are made with the same tool, They're like a twelve dollar thing from AC Moore, a little primitive Cub Scout wood burning tool to put those dots on. And the little brass tips, you can shape them in different ways. And so I'd made dots. And then here, this actually belongs to my old dearest friend, Dennis. Um, gave it to him for his second wedding. And I thought, well, if you, the, first they were dots, and then these almost look like tadpoles. And I thought, well, if they look like tadpoles, maybe they could be sperm. And I thought, well, but sperm might be a little adolescent. But then I remembered that Edvard Munch, one of my favorite Madonnas, uh, has a has a border of sperm on it. I thought if it's good enough for Monk, it's good enough for me. So I made sex pots. This is number five. <laughs> I think the first one was sold to then uh, head of the Museum of Fine Arts, Malcolm Rogers. We were at the museum school of sale, and I was chatting it up with this guy, talking about how they weren't to scale and how I'd done my sperm research and all that. And we were joking around and. And I thought that's who I was talking to. And later, I, the, one of the women said, Malcolm really loved your piece, but Malcolm never buys anything. So, but he bought it. And, uh, and years later, when he retired, you know, I, w I chatted with him at one of the opening farewell things. And he said, oh, I still love that piece. He said, you ought to get a t-shirt with that on it. So anyway, so now both Monk and, and um, Malcolm Rogers liked it. I should make more sex spots. So I've made a lot of them. So there's another one. This is called, I think this is called to scale, or maybe there are other names like from indirection, find direction out. There was one that had a little, uh, a little rectangular hole in the top. They all have a, a thing with a faux oh, egg ovum on the top. And um, one of them had a little rectangular thing in the top. And so that was of course called sperm bank. You know? And um, anyway, it went on and on. There were a lot of them. Oh, and then that, so there's the, there's the, the, the current ultimate one. Um, this is in the, this was, where was it recently? This one's been around. It was at the Biennial at, in Worcester. And it's now at the Biennial in um, the Art Museum in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Unfortunately, they put it in almost the worst place in the, play, in the, in the whole show, down in the corner too low. And everybody thought it was a wastebasket, I think. You know? But it's, it's actually 24 inches tall a new form and it's got a black interior. And I'd started it before pre-pandemic and it was sort of whimsically, I called it sex pot 13, the abyss. And you know, can never stop meaning from changing as the things change around the, you know, the context of a piece. And so by the time it was finished, COVID had come. And so abyss sounded more ominous or something. But this probably has about 8,000 you know, sperm weighs 19 pounds, I'd sit in, the, some people knit, I'd sit in my TV room and there are four different sizes of sperm and you could, you know, you, you could keep going almost indefinitely. <laughs> anyway, so that's sex spot 13. Now this one, now, how, how am I doing? Oh, we're doing right. This is just a, a lovely form. This is a lovely piece of wood. It's a piece of yew. Most yew in America, we think of it as a shrub. It can be occasionally a big tree. I've only seen I currently have one underway that's, but anyway, so this is a, a sort of beautiful thing, just celebrating the wood goddess, as I say, it's Artemis. I think that's part of her portfolio. Uh, she gets trees, um, but I didn't like this form very much because I thought the shoulder was a little too, too angular. The foot was a little too small. The, the curve was a little too flat. So I thought, it, well, I gotta make a better version. So I thought I'll make a better version in walnut. So there it is on the lathe. And again, this, this shows the process. The, the difficulty here is that, you know, you turn things, a big thing to shape between centers as if you were making a fat baseball bat, let's say. But eventually you have to hold this piece by one end while you hollow, hollow it out, sort of using an increasing size of sort of harpoons. And, but there was little bitty cutters that sort of sneak in and, and you know, Claw and then vacuum it out in the cone. It's tedious business. And anyway, so that was the, we're gonna make so now, so now we have those two, see? So I think the form on the right is much better than the one on the left. You know, better curve, better, smaller foot, um, gentler shoulder, you know, whatever. So, but then I thought, well, I was inspired by, I was gonna, 
It's always a question of being too perfect or not. This fellow just died in the last couple of weeks. And Gary Knox Bennett was his name. And if you type into Google, the nail cabinet, bang, this comes up. It caused an absolute uproar in the woodworking community back in the day, about 20 some years ago. You can't see it very well here, but you can see the level of craftsmanship that this guy was capable of. He did these extraordinary things. Well, if you look very careful at the top right panel, there's a, there's a bent nail. I don't know if you can see it sticking out of it. He, he was so tired of his own preciousness that he finished this cabinet and then he said he had a couple of beers and he took a mallet and a couple of big nails and he just nailed a piece right into the front of the cabinet. And it just drove people nuts you know, for having destroyed this beautiful thing. But he was tired about being precious. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna do something like that. But, if you, but you've gotta make it beautiful before you just wreck it because otherwise it doesn't make any point. So anyway, so I thought that's that walnut piece. And uh, I was gonna put a, just a big spike through it, but it was too pretty and I couldn't resist. I couldn't get myself to do it. So I thought, well, I'll just, just to put these little pins in. They're called a scutch and pins, solid brass, with a little round head. And so I made this piece and I was starting putting the pins in from the bottom. And I, it just, duh, it hadn't occurred to me. I finally looked inside with a flashlight and it was pretty scary in there. Um, so the so I thought ah it looks like that ancient torture device called the Iron Maiden, so this is the first Iron Maiden. In fact, there are photographs. I mean, there are images from the re, from the medieval period. No, in the Renaissance, of alleged torture devices of the many of the um, medieval world or something, and it included the uh, the so-called Iron Maiden, the cabinet and this sort of vaguely in the shape of a woman with all the knives that stick in the inside and so on. And it's not sure they ever really existed. Um, but anyway, but that's what, so that's what I called it the Iron Maiden. And it was still scary. And you have to be careful because lots of people pick, even now I've drawn blood just picking them up. There have been three of these. I don't know if I, Iron, I don't know if maidens can have generational, you know, but this was Iron Maiden one. Ah, but so this was a bit of a process. And that was sort of serendipitous, the first one. And the, so I thought, well, now I know what I'm doing. So let's, so this is how, this is the makings of set of uh, you know, Iron Maiden 2. And again, just to show the process, the wallet's still on the lathe. There's an indexing head on the lathe that's, that turns every 15 degrees. You can stop it. So I built a, the little table instead of the tool rest. And so this is from somebody else's idea. So you could draw, you could just lay a pencil on this little board, drag it across and draw a line around it perfectly on center. Then I'd turn it 15 degrees and do another one, another one, another one. So 24 times around the outside. And then once it's marked, then you can just turn the, turn the lathe and just and I forget which is longitude and which is latitude, but then you could turn the, the circumferal nuns really easily just on the lathe and turning it on. Then, so all those pencil marks, then I would take a little bitty, I'm slightly obsessive, take a little, a tiny little wood burner with like a signature pen, mark all the intersections, then sand off all the lines and then drill the holes and then put the pins in. So that, so this became that, boom, it's not fun to see. <laughs> you know? And also, um, I'm, I can't remember, dear Edmund, the physicist, I'm blanking on his last name from church. Taylor. Taylor. Oh yeah, people would say, well, how do you draw the curved lines? And I'd say, I don't draw curved lines. You can see, I mean, the previous one, they're just latitude and longitude, there's just a grid. You know, and there's and there's one where the look you square, and I so I talked to Edmund about it. And he said, "Yeah, just like curved space and stuff." That and all of the curved lines are are straight lines if you look at them from the right angle, and so on and so on. So anyway, they're just just a grid laid down on because I loved grids since I was a kid. I loved waffles. I loved graph paper. You know, <laughs> I love the farmland in Iowa. You know, everything's a you no. Know, Anyway, so that was that's Iron Maiden two. Now Iron Maiden one won a prize at the uh, at, a, at a, the Roddy exhibition in Concord about six years ago, and this and and Iron Maiden her daughter, if that's possible, 
won a bigger prize. I mean, more money, inflation, I guess, uh, just last, uh, last year when she won a prize there too. And there's Iron Maiden of three. And she's going to be seen, she's the one who's, she's going to Marblehead, uh, along with Deep Blue that I'll show you in a bit. Anyway, so this is a taller one. They got, they got bigger uh, as, as they got, went along. So I forget where it is right now. But anyway, so that one's, about, this one's about 20 inches tall. And there, and if, if the pins can go in, the pins can also stay out. You know, so there, these are Audis. There's the one on the left is a hollow vessel that was called bristle, and the one lying there on the on the floor that's just that's solid walnut, and um, it's called prickle. And prickle prickle is the collective term for a gathering of of uh, porcupines. So that's a, and and that one too. I knew it was going to crack, so I just put I, that one. I put in the oven for eight hours or something at about two hundred degrees, so it didn't boil, but it would just get the cracking over with. And the cracks are hidden in the back here, and in some places I had to put a little pin in the crack so I could put the pin where it would be to be in them anyway. So that's more pins. And here's the tour de force. This one's also going to be in Marblehead with Iron Maiden three. This one's called Deep Blue Starfield. <clears throat> It's made of elm, it's about 20 inches tall, and it has 2,544 pins in it. The first one, Iron Maiden, I, I, I bought out two Home Depots to buy those little escutcheon pins. By now I'd found a place in Rhode Island where you can buy pins by the pound, and a pound of, of them, whether there's 2,500 in a pound or 400 of the bigger ones, it's all the same. In other words, the manufacturing is incidental. It's just the weight of the brass itself. People often ask artists, they ask me, you know, how long did it take to make something? And I say, I often don't know and I lose track. But in this case, I, I kept track of how long it took to put the pins in uh, after everything was done. It was completely finished, stained, whatever, holes drilled, all the holes drilled with the Dremel tool. And it took 13 and a half hours to put the pins in. A little needle nose pliers and a tap, 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 tap. <laughs> so. Um, so I decided, okay, okay, I think I've made my point. And, and the problem with the lathe is that everything is always uh, radial and symmetrical and stuff. So let me try something completely different. And so this was um, called Serpens 1 colon, this is called Coil. Coil's been around a bit too, he's right sitting here on the floor in my dining room. I have a big inventory in my dining room here. Um, but, um, and this was, I thought, well, let's, this was not, this was made on the lathe only in that I used the lathe just to hold a piece of wood in place while I worked on it. And it was, it was also sort of playing with the idea that I, we humans are sort of hardwired to look at eyes and be attracted to them. But we're also sort of hardwired to hate snakes, a lot of us. And so this was really meant to be a kind of approach avoidance tug thing that you had. And, um, because I made, I wanted to make a piece that some people might not like. My stuff had gotten to be sort of so likable and accomplished and technically virtuous that they struck me as being a little timid. So, and this has got a taxidermy glass eye that stares out at you. I this showed at a place up in Gloucester last year, and a fellow told me how much he liked it. And he said, "I said, well, I'd made decided after, after you know, that I wanted to make people make pieces that people might not like." And he said, "Well, you failed." So anyway, he liked it. Um, all right. So and that's this is just to show if you look at it carefully, it's cracked. So it looks like it might have been segmented turned, but it was turned from the second. There's the piece of walnut on the left. And this piece was made from the, the next 18 inches of that same piece of wood. So it's for them. It's really a, a large version of um, the barley corn twist, old-fashioned candlesticks and stuff. Sometime had that twist in it, or a Solomonian, Solomonian curve like the uh, the pillars in uh, the Vatican, whatever. Anyway, so there's. And then along the way, at some point, I was watched. Did some guy did a demonstration of his wood turning, and he was making things he called reliquaries, and I hated his stuff. And I wrote, I had a notepad and I wrote on it, I said, chicken bones reliquary. So I decided to make a reliquary for, uh, for wishbones. 
And so this is the piece that resulted. There were some different forms, but this is a chunk of African blackwood. It's about six inches square and six inches tall. And it's gold leafed around a magnifying glass on the top. And it's, you notice the little, what comes first, the chicken or the eggs? Well, they're little egg shaped. Those that's 24 karat gold. It's real gold leaf, which is exciting to work with, really fun. And um, it's very, Gold leaf is so amazing. A, a two inch cube would cover a football field. That's how thin it is, a couple hundred atoms thick. And one way to test if it's real gold is if you put a fleck of it on your, on your skin and rub it, it just disappears. It just you know, rubs into the skin. Anyway, so this was, um, this was called furcula. I learned that word. The furcula is the scientific name for, for uh, uh, wishbone. And that's what it looks like from the top. And this leads to terrible jokes, but I'll make it anyway. This is the the the, the old expression. If the, by the way, the reason chicken, the reason um, we have chickens have wishbones, birds have wishbones, is they're springy and they keep the lung cavity open, so birds can breathe fast enough to fly when they fly. So it's a very useful useful thing. And and then. The old expression: if pigs had wings, well, then we'd have enormous wishbones, you know, for pig roasts and stuff. Anyway, so here's another reliquary. This is called Filthy Lucre. Uh, I love this little chunky thing. It's six by six by six inches, and it's got patinated gold pennies in it, and uh, I mean pennies in it, and that silver sort of gold leaf around the, the, uh, de the decoration as well. And there's another one called Out of Africa. It's a, it's a vertebra of some animal that I found on in South Africa many years ago it was still around so I gold leafed the um, the vertebra and it's that's about 24 inches tall and um, it almost looks like a Minoan bull's head when it's when it's turned into turned into gold and this is can you hear that tap tap tapping is that yeah okay sorry so maybe it's putting pins in pots somewhere. Anyway, and this one, this, I guess maybe it's because I grew up profoundly and pathologically Calvinist in Iowa, Dutch Calvinist, and, and um, they hated Catholics. By the way, now and now in that same village, the Catholic mass is said in Spanish, and things have changed a lot. But anyway, so this is, um, so I, I, I made a whole series of reliquaries that spoof the notion of precious remnants of there are six heads of John the Baptist, supposedly, in various places in the world. You know, there are six, half a dozen sacred foreskin of Christ are relics in, in churches around the world. You know, there are, you know, there's a really interesting book called Holy Something Precious, Something Holy Dirt. Anyway, this is called Song de Boeuf, which means blood of ox blood. And it's instead of having a Tau cross, it has a T-bone steak bone, which was delicious, by the way. And, um, and that color is, the, it's on a base, the top of the thing is, is with, it's leather dye. Uh, 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 so it's blood of, the, blood of the cow rather than the blood of Christ, if I allow myself that. And this is the one I published in the Unitarian R1 magazine last year in black and white. This is just called Reliquary Redwood. It's um, quilted redwood, gorgeous stuff. And then in the, the little reliquary, relics in the top include those are redwood uh, seeds, um, ashes, and needles are embedded in that one. And here's another one. I hadn't done cabinet making for a long time. A lot of the reliquaries are really elaborate, very elaborate things with strange, humble little objects inside. And uh, this one's called the crown reliquary, and it does have a dental artifact as its, as its crown. It's lighted up. First time I ever put lights in the thing and drilled a hole in it recently. It was just in a show at the Boston Sculptors Gallery. And uh, anyway, so, and this is called uh, reliquary, I forget which number, it's called the Playboy reliquary. And it's a, it's a, a consciously, purposely sort of phallic, of uh, shape form it's glued up stave constructed leopard wood with a dome on the top and then it's um and it's got a, a vintage key a uh, playboy key fob as its artifact it was interesting it was just in a show at the bsg and i would ask people what do you think i'm saying with this piece because the artist never owns the meaning you know 
And I'd say, and some people thought I was sort of, I was presenting this as a precious object, this keyboard, this Playboy, you know, Kifa. And I'm presenting it as a, as a vestige, a relic of a failed belief system, you know. Um, and the, the notion that there was once a Playboy club in Boston is late, it's in the late, late 60s amazes me now or something. So, but there's an awful lot of Playboy mm -hmm. memorabilia out there. And then this, by extension, this is sort of related to relic bars, but this is called Ossuary Barbie. You can probably see it on my wall <laughs> over my shoulder here. Um, this 156 Barbie doll heads, and it's referential to uh, the so-called bone churches of Eastern Europe. Uh, Joelle, my dear daughter, when she was studying in Prague for the year, went to see this. This is a church called Sedlik where you may have heard of it, there are, the walls are covered with human skulls. There's a chandelier made out of every, every bone in the human body. And um, it's to remind us that life is fleeting, you know. But Joel said, it's still pretty strange. You say that was a person, that was a person, that was a person. So this is um, referential to that. And um, it's called, and an ossuary, of course, is a container for bones. So, and again, this one changed because it, it was made before the pandemic and, you know, things that suggest mass death, you know, are less amusing, you know, as, as it's really happening. And then by extension, there's this one. This is called The Secrets in Their Eyes. This was just in a show at, in Boston too. This is a 60 some pairs of, of um, good glass, German glass eyes from this, and mechanisms from the sleepy doll eyes. I have another smaller one made of plastic ones. This is the upscale version. <laughs> um, and it's a reference to a movie, wonderful movie called The Secret in Their Eyes. I just think, you know, what this is to it both suggests the, sort of these are the babies, the, these are the dolls that were watching our babies or whatever, or it may suggest the surveillance society that we've come to live in, whatever. Tom. And that's the show that was just in at close at the Boston Sculptors Gallery. Um, I think most, you've seen almost all the pieces. Well, the one on the there's the one on the left, that's Iron Maiden three, the one to, to its right, that's called Antipodes. I didn't show it here. Antivity just means the opposite sides of the planet. And if you turn that piece around, it looks completely different. On the wall is something called hump. Joel wants that one a lot, but that's just a section of a walnut thing. Anyway, so that's a show that just closed. And ha, ah, so now we picked up on, I'm almost finished here. We picked up on the Desperate Measures pieces that I'd done long 15 years ago. This was a, I had started to turn this walnut thing, a walnut vessel, and it was standing in my shop, in the basement studio shop, and it had just split open. So I thought, okay, let's go back. I found, I didn't, I still had the bolts left over and stuff. So I didn't even have to buy new hardware. And that's one of my first corporate thing. That's going to be in the art collection of a, of a hip hotel in, um, I'm told it's hip. I haven't seen it in, um, the South End, called the AC Marriott at the Ink Block. It has a it has an art collection, and this is going to be in that collection. And then if you've got if you've got it, you might as well flaunt it. So here's a that one's standing in the corner to my right shoulder here. That's a tall piece. It's about 28 inches tall, I think, something like that. <clears throat> Another wall. And this time I just turned the wall the, the walnut to a cylinder, and uh, and put it uh, left it to crack. And I leaned it against actually the little uh, oil-fed, you know, radiator heater downstairs. So it would, because it was too big to go in this, in this, in my stove, in my oven. So it cracked open obligingly. And then I filled it with eight pounds of bolts. And then there's also always new stuff to explore. And so this is actually a piece of alabaster uh, being turned on the lathe. The, the problem is that you, it, it, alabaster is very soft. It, it's like talcum powder. They manufacture a sheet, uh, sheet rock, gypsum board out of the kind of stone. And um, so, but the problem is how do you hold the piece? You know, once you've turned the one end. So I, I turned a wooden big chunk to hold the piece while I finished the second half. And so you wind up with, a pod like that. That has, that has interesting prospects. I've gotten some other chunks of alabaster. So I want to play around with that, uh, some more of that, and maybe combine it with ebony. Uh, would be really nice, very, very black wood and, and white stone. 
And then this is the last image. And I'm also working on this guy. <clears throat> He's called the Shigir Idol, S-H-I-G-I-R. It is my homage to, uh, which a lot of my stuff is, the older I get, the older is the art that I love. And this is an homage to the oldest known wood sculpture on the planet astonishingly old. Uh, they, we call it the Shiger Idol, assuming it has a religious function, it may not. It was found on a peat bog in the Urals in the late 19th century. They've been arguing about how old it was and it was, they now know it was about 11,500 years old. You know, um, hunter gatherer period, hunter gatherer period, you know, way, way back. And it was on top, it was like a totem pole, haha, -ha, going all the way back to my first piece, I guess. Uh, it was just as a figure atop, it may have just been a boundary marker, a warning or whatever, we don't know, but, and it was made from larch. And of all things, I had never had it before, but I had two big pieces of larch in the garage. So I figured I'd make a larch homage to the larch uh, Shiger idol. Now the only question is how to make it look 12,000 years old. You know, but, uh, but I like it. And the one thing I loved about the design of it is that whoever made it, and it was fun to work on this face and think about, you know, the other, the other human who was, you know, whacking away at a piece of larch back in the day, but the mouth was slightly off center. And I just love it. So it sort of gives an expression to the face that it wouldn't have had otherwise. And it also had, um, they, they knew it was cut, cut with stone tools. And also um, there was some evidence that, oh, excuse me, I'll get it. There was some evidence that it was carved with stone tools and with, with a uh, beaver skull teeth. So I, of course, had to buy a, a order of beaver skull and uh, found out a lot about beaver's teeth. And I've been through a lot of dental nightmares. And so, boy, if you needed a root can tell when you're a beaver, the, the, the tooth starts at the back at the side of the jaw or something. So anyway, so I just learned it's such fun and to discover stuff and, and one thing leads to another. And, it finally left to the end. So that's it. Thank you. Is that enough? Too much. 45 minutes. Yes, Phew. Thank you very much. It was lovely. Thank Let me you. Stop. I, I thought it was very interesting, too. How do I stop sharing? No, share. Nope. I don't want, don't want to share. Mark, help me. How do I get back out of here? Oh, there it is. There, okay. Oh, and Jean sneaked in while I was prattling on. And Martha, boy, all you folks who I now know, and I didn't know when church was really church. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, thank you, Derek. This was what I, I didn't get to see all of it, but I really enjoyed it. So, sorry, go ahead. Um, if the piece cracks while it's on the lathe, is it dangerous? Does it fly across the room? If the wood, if it, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's usually more predictable. Although <laughs> once I had a piece, uh, like a chunk of burl, a chunk of it just came off. I mean, a piece of burl uh, where they can be unstable, you know, and try to be really careful. I mean, and, uh, you know, I wear a big face shield, face mask and, um, and so on, but, uh, the, the cracking that you're seeing here is happening while it's drying, you know, so it's, it's not, although in that last case, it was, I, I kept a, um, while I was turning the form, I kept a, uh, strap clamp around to hold it together, just so there was no possibility that, because you know that, the, you know, because you, because when you turn it, you want to keep it enough speed so that you're not, if it were too slow, the tool might catch that crack as it came around or something. Otherwise, you're just sort of, you're holding the tool in place and the wood comes to the tool rather than pushing the tool into the wood. So that conceivably could be, but yeah, that, that yeah. I mean, you, right, you don't want it throwing things. But one time a chunk of burl came off and that's about a thousand pound machine with its base filled with sand. And it, a, a chunk came off a burl and went somewhere and the and then the big machine started to walk around the, the, the basement <laughs> there's a big there's a big emergency button you can hit to stop it and stuff but but yeah those are especially that bit those bigger pieces and then <clears throat> the bigger stuff 
you know, that machine will probably turn. Well, I've had a 300 pound piece, 250 pound piece of wood on it using a chain fall to lift it up into place and stuff. And you just start really slow and sneak up on it. And once, you know, you keep the, basically keep the speed at which the lathe isn't vibrating because of it's, you know, and we've gotten better with a chainsaw to bring, to make things as symmetrical as possible before you put them on the machine, you know, but. But the other way, I mean, the, the question, one question might be, well, what if you don't want the wood to crack? And that is that that's that mo almost all my vessels are, are end, end grain turned from the end, in other words, down through it rather than into the side. And so when they dry, there's much less. Um, and also you, you make the wall thickness uh, as uniform as possible, because with what makes things crack is when parts are drying faster than others. And so it sets up tensions that then make them make the wood crack. But so when I turn stuff and I've gotten better at that too, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, and I don't try to make them breathtakingly thin. The walls are maybe a half inch thick, you know, and there's lots of ways, including laser guidance systems and stuff to try to keep them from blowing them up, you know, making a funnel like the time I tore the top off that walnut piece. And then I learned my lesson and I eventually did the same thing again, you know, tore the top off. But it, um, uh, so it's you know, sort of learning to respect the materials and so on. Do you have to wear gloves? Gloves, no, sometimes, but, the, but also you always cut the fingers off the gloves because the gloves tend to be too long. And so you just really don't want your fingers to get, you know, the glove to get caught in the, in the short gap between the tool rest and the cutting and the piece. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I've got some also, they, they, um, uh, they're anti-vibration gloves that people sometimes use them for bike riding. I know you use those for, for the hollow turning when it's pretty thunk a thunk a thunk a thunk, you know, and it's, and as I'm, and I've, as I've gotten older, which somehow bodies insist on getting older, no matter what, you know, it's the stubby lathe, by the way, is, is made um, so that you can stand up and work and, and as you hollow, you're going right, standing up and going straight ahead. Otherwise with the lathe, normal lathe, you have to sort of lean around the corner and, and, and hollow it that way or something. So it's, there's much less physical, you know, um, abuse, you know, with that kind of lathe than there might be with others. Derek, how many pieces are you work? Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. How, are, how many pieces are you working on at any given time? I mean, you've uh, got something on the lathe, but then are you also then yeah, well, tap, sort tap, tapping of. on pins or? Yeah, I'm not very methodical, but the nice thing is, and the, good, the nice thing in having this, this shot studio in my basement is that it, it may, it's part of my life, you know, and that you can come and go. It's not like my dear lady, Mary in California is a, you know, is becoming a serious painter, but she's got to sort of set it up and put it away every time, you know. Mine, it's in the basement, and so you can take 10 minutes to go down and put another coat of something on it one night. And then and then there's usually, there's, a, there's usually two or three pieces probably, and but I'm not very orderly, you know. You can see from that, my, my basement. The nice thing is I've, been, I've he's gotten to be quite a good friend. He's a wonderful painter uh, from Watertown. He's painting a, a, a big, uh, he's, he does, he's a realist painter, but a photo realist painter. He's only been doing it for four years or something. I have one of his paintings. It's of a wood chipper next to a fallen log. It's perfect for me. And it was from a photograph in Waltham. And it's, the machine was, for, was named Vermeer, was the company. So I call it my Vermeer painting. Because I grew up with all sorts of Dutch folks named Vermeer back in Iowa, you know, and stuff. But Paul is now doing a, um, he was just named one of five artists of the year at the Cambridge Art Association last week. I just saw him, but he's doing a painting of my, a real photorealistic painting of my basement. What's his last name? Uh, Beckingham. Look him up on, on, look up on Instagram. He's a wonderful man and, um, uh, Literally four years ago, his father died and he decided he needed something to do to distract himself. So he started painting and he's, he's got 32 unfinished paintings at the moment, he told me last week, but he's on Instagram. And for a while there, you could go watch him paint my basement. <laughs> that was really uncanny. And then he came over to visit because he had some questions about what was that object over there and stuff. 
and, and then he's doing a little separate separate cell of you know formal portrait of my lathe for me <laughs> so, but yeah look him up on instagram paul beckingham he's a sweetheart yeah uh, uh, Derek, um, maybe you've answered this. I had to come I in late, but never I just wanted through, so. to ask you, what are, um, it seems like wood has so much versatility because you're using not only wood, but uh, tools and other aspects, of, you know, the gold, the silver, the, the glass right. and all. What other media were you working on before you, you came into wood that did not provide the challenges or the opportunities that you got with that's, wood? Jeannie, that's a very, that's a very nice question. 50, year, 50 years ago today, I was a museum school student and I was also teaching photography. I taught a basic photography course. I was a photographer until, as I say, it disappeared into the computer in the eighties because I wanted, I'm an old guy. And I, and I grew up in the village in Iowa and we had a wood pile in the back and we made stuff, physical stuff, you know, and the, the edge of our family land was an alfalfa field. And so we, you know, we lived in a physical world. And uh, uh, so I eventually, when I went to museum school, I also discovered the wood shop there. And I thought, oh, I used to be able to do, I, mean, I was good at this stuff. And that, um, yeah, but I used to be a photographer. I was, turns out, I was, in the first, I am so, <laughs> anyway, um, I was in the first exhibition of photographs done by the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston. It was not where it is now. It was not in the firehouse on Boylston Street. It was in a townhouse on Beacon Hill. That's how long ago it was. It was called Young Photographers of Boston, something. They actually put our ages of the people in the, in the catalog. There was a separate card for each person. And yeah, I was 26 years old, you know, but, but it, and then I worked on my house in Cambridge for about 10 years and I'm making, doing almost everything. I cried like a baby when we moved to Belmont, sorry, Belmont, I've been here longer now, but, um, but so once I finished with that house, I sort of wanted, needed to make stuff. And so I bought an old lathe and um, the, probably the same kind that we used in shop class, literally, because all the shop classes have pretty much closed. So I started, it went from sort of construction to back to making, um, you know, stuff in wood. But, and who- Well, it just seems that it, it would be great for students who love to work with their hands and don't really fit in uh, to have the, the opportunity to be in a shop where they could make things like this instead of making a chair or table. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and I have my dining room in my living room. I have the table that I made while I was at the museum school, a walnut thing with a glass top. But this allows me to tell me the story. Thank you, Gene. One time I was in, I was teaching that creative process class, and I would tell people it's not, it wasn't to try to make them artists, it was just to think about creative problem solving, you know, and what and so I would half my creativity was that I would have somebody else teach it about half the time. But I'd bring in people from, and I told them, I can't teach you to be creative, but I can help model the process. And I brought in other people to, to you know, even from the sciences as well, to just think, to talk about, you know, creative process in psychology or in biology or whatever. And these kids just, you know, had to do a project, but they almost never did anything physical because they, well, one, they don't have a, they don't have a, a shop in the basement and whatever, but at one point, Oh, you, Jeannie, you set me up for this perfect thing here. Um, <laughs> I had a student named CJ, and CJ told me, he, I said, went around and said, well, what's your project? What are you going to do? And he says, he said, I'm going to build a boat. And I said, really? <laughs> I got immediately excited. I said, what are you going to build it out of? And he said, out of wood. And um, I said, well, how big is it going to be? He said, about three feet. I said, you mean this long? With my, with my favorite tape measure and uh, went on. And then the student said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're carrying a tape measure in your pocket. And I said, I always carry a tape measure in my pocket. Usually I have two, but I gave one to my friend Dennis last week. He said, well, give me one of them. I gave him Anyway, these are great, but for like three bucks, Stanley thing, 40 inches long, you just clip off the little key fob silly thing and you can keep in your pocket. And I said, I keep it in my pocket to remind me that we live in a physical world. You know, and I use it a lot too. I mean, somewhere in the, Strindberg's The Dream Play, I think there's a poet who carries around a bucket of dirt. 
the whole time. He said it he helps keep him grounded. <laughs> you know, yes. so, you know, it's uh, so yeah. But it, I really need to work with make stuff with my hands. You know? uh, Derek, getting back to the whole thing about students, um, I sort of lament the fact that what's your opinion about? They're not shop classes. I mean, when I think back to my middle school, and I, I do a lot, of the, I, there's a whole Facebook group with a, um, my folks from my hometown, and people always go back to, and what do they remember? What did you make in shop class? Hmm. And I still have the bowl that I did on the lathe in shop class. My father had it on the desk and kept his, you know, paper clips in it. And I still have my plastic, you know, several things from shop class and my napkin holder and like, do kids have any opportunity to be exposed to that, you know, when they're, um, you know, youngsters? I mean, maybe you go off to college, you can do it, but it, it's so, I find, I, I really feel badly that that isn't available. No, I, I, I do too, you know, and some of it's just liability issues and all that stuff. But I mean, even for instance, I know that because early on, I knew the fellow when I was starting wood coming, I went to went a fellow, he was teaching at, at, uh, the boys school of Belmont, which one is that? Anyway, but there they have a tradition every, and then they, somewhere they're all kept. They, every kid, every boy has to carve a plaque, you know, of a certain thing. And they're, they're all there in the collection something. And this was a fellow named Tom Sherwood who taught there part-time, sadly he died soon after I spent a day with him. Um, but anyway, but yeah, no, I think it's, you know, I, when I, when I, in that, creative process class I one week it was they had to I we talked a lot well we, we used several texts called the, the texts were a, a whack on the side of the head which is sort of a uh, and the other is a Twyla Tharp's book with the creative habit how to use how to the choreographer it's a wonderful book um, and um, uh, and what else? But then we also read excerpts from think, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci and, and Mozart's, Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot. That was one. And then there's a, there's a wonderful book by, by Frank or Frankel or something called The Hand. I mean, there's all sorts of evidence that we get smarter if we use our hands, you know, make, to do stuff, you know. And um, when I when I some at some point I said they had to make something physical with their hands for the week's assignment and and it was sort of pathetic to see what they'd come in with, you know, because they don't. But I said, I but some some can we bake a bake a cake? I said, sure, you, anything with your hands, you know. But they, you know, it was it, but they're just not they don't have that tradition or that expectation or that interest. You know, and lots of organizations, you know, the, the American Association of Woodturners is just always struggling to, you know, to try to get young people interested, you know, because I once went to one of the national symposiums and symposiums, maybe in Kansas City, and I got there a little late and they had the big banquet thing and I walked into this big banquet hall and it was just a sea of bald and gray heads, you know, <laughs> all the good, and about 95% male too, unfortunately, you know, but, oh. so, uh, Anyway, so yeah, no, I think it's it's a it's a sadness that we're that, but I I you know wrote a memoir but that didn't almost got published didn't but it was about the Boy Scouts and it was comparing the Boy Scout manual that I used in in the fifties and the one that's used now and even in the Boy Scouts there's far it's just conspicuous that there's far less expectation that that boys will have contact contact with the natural world. There's less camping, there's, there's less camping, there's less cooking. The cooking merit badge used to have a tripod cast iron kettle on it. Now it has a chef's hat and a whisk. You know? <laughs> so, and, and there's, you know, the nature merit badge. There are fewer kinds of birds and there's no, you know, camping and woodcraft. You know, it just, it's a sort of a vanishing reality, you know, and... Uh, but we're just old folks to them. So, you know, <laughs> what do we know? But, but yeah, no, I'm making things with my hands is really important. That's why when photography, I like in the dark room, you holding up this, I mean, this plus just the magic of what, chemi you know, the chemistry magic in a dark room, but just the making of physical things. And once it was hitting the print button, you know, just wasn't the same. So. Mm. Rachel. Yeah. 
Rachel, do you have a question? Well, I noticed, mm -hmm. um, I noticed the humor in a lot of your work. Uh, and I wondered okay. if that, if you feel like that's a pervasive um, kind of view that you take with whatever you do, or if you have pieces that feel very serious to you. Wow. Which, which ones are funny? <laughs> Playboy, the Barbies, I think the, um, what's it called? Desperate measures. Just this, yeah. like this cheekiness yeah. and this yeah, kind no, of, it doesn't, it could be dark humor, but it's humor. Well, like Abyss. I mean, I think that's a, you know, that's a good one. Because it's sort of, it was spoofing, but then not not funny you know um i don't know i mean i've been i've sat in on a lot of your stuff i mean you i don't know what my attitude is i think my attitude it, do you mean some stuff do i think it's really serious um i mean how you feel about it when you're making it when you set out with your vision not so much how it's received or even how you talk about it at shows but like right. if the seed of the idea feels like something very serious versus kind of playful or maybe there's an arc in the process but i wondered if that varies. I think I'm probably phobic about being too pretentious. You know, I mean, uh, the, that that I that I don't want to take myself too seriously. And I think one of the one of the biggest lessons I've learned in life, if I've learned any, is to a sense of proportion, keeping things in perspective. You know, that things that may seem like a disaster are only really a big problem. You know, and so on. But um, but I also don't, I don't, I don't, not, not playful enough, I suppose, because I once did it, it went to Anderson Ranch, a wonderful place out near Aspen, Colorado, and um, did a, a, a week's workshop in form. And we just, we, we just rough turned stuff just very quickly, like sketching, you know, and um, and then we marked them with a stamp on the bottom so you didn't know who made what. And we'd often spray paint them black to see the, just the form. And then um, at, at the end of the week, we, we burned all of them except stuff. And so it was just not getting overly invested. That's the problem with, with you know, the, the, the kind of time that's involved that you, you don't want it. You, there's a disincentive to get creative, you know, part way through because you've got so much time invested in it already. So that's, that's a hazard, you know. Um, and I don't make that many pieces, maybe a dozen a year, you know. And um, so it's, because sometimes I, 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 you're right, I should probably, because sometimes it's really fun, you know. I think you can see, because I don't, I grew up in Iowa, I don't want to think about uh, surfing or, or downhill skiing, but boy, <laughs> You get a wet log, you know, and uh, the the shavings just go streaming. I mean, it's just somewhere in my avatar. I have an avatar image, it's just it's just covered with you know with shavings and stuff. It's such fun. You think, whoa, this is like maybe skiing. I don't know. That's your be that's your beaver spirit animal talking, Derek. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but plus, I just you know, I mean, just my ex-wife once said Sudoku or whatever that thing is, whatever, I don't know what that, and she says, well, I do it when I'm bored. She said, and I said, I'm not, and this is not, hope not, not pretend, I am never bored, ever, you know, tired, and I have a weird sleep schedule. I go to bed at two and get up about 10, and um, all that, because I can, because I can, and um, especially now, um, but no, there's always, I mean, I, I watch, bit, you know, um, videos of beavers. They're better than I thought, you know, I and mean, they're really amazing. I mean, you, I've watched them cut down a four inch diameter tree and just pretty quickly, big chunks of wood coming out, you know, and the teeth, you know, are, look at those teeth. And then they're, they're orange because of all the iron in their teeth and then the back of the the back of the tooth is soft and so it's self-sharpening so as you do this it wears it away and you always get a fresh edge and it's just that's some, it's such some wonderful stuff to know about you know or about you know the sugar idol found in a peat bog and you know on and on it's really fun and i really did i mean i really i <clears throat> uh, i do feel connected to to 
and I'm, and I'm routinely humbled by the, the work of ancient artisans, you know, who did just astonishing stuff under, you know, largely you know, often primitive circumstances throughout history. I mean, it's amazing, you know, and some of it collective, you know, uh, a lot more of that than we might have thought, you know. But the whole thing has changed about, you know, into the artist's ego rather than the, the artist making the best representation of a shared culture, you know. That's why I went to Bali on my sabbatical and plus my, my Lady Mary has a bungalow in Bali, but anyway. But yeah. I, was, I wanted to go to Bali where it was often said that there's no word for art in Bali. That's there right. For different kinds of artists, but not for art. Art, the word for artist and human are the same. And, and the assumption is, and because there's no word, yeah. real word for religion either in Bali, because they're all art and religion are tangled up in, in, in ritual and ceremony and stuff. And it's part of life, you know, so it's, you know, there are 10,000 temples in Bali. So, you know, ranging from the mother church, Basaki, you know, on Mount Basaki to, uh, you know, to family temples. And we went to those too. And, you know, the Bali is talk about having an outsized reputation. Bali is, one fifth the size of Massachusetts. <laughs> so it's it's if it has ten thousand temples, it's like saying there's ten thousand temples between here and Worcester <laughs> or Framingham, you know. And um, you know, and then and, and you know, there's a, a lot of tourist junk, you know, tourist stuff. But even I've sat and watched guys better than car sitting on the floor with unhandled sharp things, just carving wonderful stuff, you know. And the, the young man, the driver for, that we had most of the time, I asked him well, what, is, what, is, what he wanted his boy to be when he grew up, he was a two-year-old son, and he said, I want him to be a painter, not a house painter, a, an artist, you know? So, you know, and I thought, wow, that's really, but a lot of it, but it's also, I have a photograph of, a, of from, from the museum there of a, by a young artist in, in Bali, and he was, he's like sprawled. I think he's dead. It's like a, you know, a skeletal remains sitting in a chair, an artist stuff with art materials and alcohol bottles and stuff strewn around his feet. Like it's hard to be, you know, a, a contemporary artist in Bali because there's so much, you know, conservative tensions of the shared culture that you don't mess with. So, you know, it's, but it's, you know, it's it's a, it's it, it's just interesting what's happened to the to the artist, the role of the the, the, yeah. thought, the role of the artist. You know, in well, the, back in to the, your uh, art. When you start a piece, you have an idea in mind, but as the piece is being made, all of a sudden, does it talk to you to change? Sometimes, but there there are certain things. The good question, Nicole. Um, it, the, 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 a lot of the stuff is driven by the materials because you can't, you know, it's, it, you know, unlike ceramics, it's a you know, wood turning is usually a subtractive process. And so you, you know, you're removing stuff, you can't keep adding to it and stuff. So it's a, uh, there, it's conservative in, in that way too. But um, I never draw the stuff. I mean, I, a lot of stuff is just, well, what can I make of, here's, here's the, here's, there's a finite object what can we make from it or what's in here not to do the sort of oh michelangelo said i just take a chunk of stone and said oh you know remove the excess <laughs> you know, whatever um but it's you know and it, so it's it, you know i can't say i want to have make an eight by ten foot canvas the equivalent of that because it's just there are limits on the on the physicality of it too so um but sometimes, often, Nicole, it's a, it's a conceptual idea that one, but you can notice too in my work, there's a, this, there's a series, you know, the, that they, uh, a sequence of, oh, let's, let's do reliquary. It was fun to though find that old notebook where it said chicken bones reliquary. And then that's led, to, that's led all the way to this and to the eyeballs, you know, um, and the, and and desperate measures was something that was always sort of fun and funny. And then thought, oh my goodness, here's you know a ready-made in the basement. So, so there's a lot of that following. But I sometimes wonder now. Well, now what am I going to do? You know, 
but like I said, you know, there's there's stone. I mean, there's alabaster. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of things you can. And then you know, and it's a, a, the story they were telling. And then if you ever lost it, happened. Even if you actually watched that interview with me on on YouTube, I mean, it's I say it telling all the same stuff. But but the, I mean, it's the, I also recognize the sort of the absurdity of what I do. Because I am literally sitting with Joelle, my daughter was here. The, she counted 30, 30 some things in the in the living room that I'd made. <laughs> you know, now I'm sitting here in the dining room. Well, I, you know, there. Why am I still making stuff? It's not leaving that place. You know, all artists. <laughs> but then here comes here comes one of my great favorite you know stories. My brother, who's now a Jungian psychoanalyst in Los Angeles, who's also trained as a printmaker and. And he was at the University of Iowa in the early 70s, and he was doing a little, little craft show thing to try to sell some stuff. And the next, the guy in the next booth was making doodads of some sort or another. And um, it, the kid finally, at the end of the day, said, he said, well, I'm not selling anything, so I might as well go home and make some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's sort of how I feel sometimes, you know. Hi. Uh, Doug? Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, a thought to your quiver of thoughts uh, sure. on the subject of working with your hands. Sure. Uh, if we go back uh, half a century, oh, more than half a century, I was an undergraduate at MIT right. and majoring in physics. And in our sophomore year, we were required, each student individually was required to make a metal hammer and separately to make a Geiger counter. A, a Geiger and counter. Glass blowing and lathing with metal and how do you knurl the, them and so forth. I, I don't know what happened to my Geiger counter, but I kept the hammer uh, right. around for years. I don't know whatever happened to it now, but this was a requirement for physics majors. <laughs> well, and after all, I was only, only was reminded later, but I mean, the, the, um, the beavers, the mascot for MIT, you know, the, yeah. the original yeah, so, engineer. You can see it my ring. Right. Yeah, that's a, some people put a stone in it. It's one of the few uh, college uh, rings without a stone. It's just carved, right. the carved beaver. Some people put a diamond in it. And I thought that was sort of sacrilege. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> leave it with the beaver. And it's to show work. <laughs> the beaver works. Anyways, anyway, so, that, so yeah, it's, um, I still make stuff, you know? Yeah. Do you find when you're, well, maybe, when you're at um, or in a major show like the show at the Peabody Essex Museum, uh, right. that it stimulates you to create new things because the variety in that show is so unbelievably fabulous. And even I, who I'm not someone who works with wood, right. I got excited about wood all over again. I mean, which so you mean? Do you know that you mean that specific show, the uh, audacious one? Yes, that one. Right. I, yeah. That was just it was mind boggling. Yeah, somewhat. It's it struck me as the um, almost too too much a display of virtuosity, though. Mm. It's um, you know that and and there gets to be kind of at the extreme, a kind of desperate. Oh my God, what can we do that's different than everybody else? You know and. Um, <laughs> One of my favorite pieces in that show was a, it was a little bowl made out of, of compressed um, comic books or something like that, you know, of, of laminated paper or something like that, you know, and there were just these extraordinary, you know, things. But yeah, it's. So that I know what I, what, I, what I like is when I really get inspired is, is like when I see. Well, inspiration can come from lots of places, obviously, but it's about anything that what I really love is in the movies, for instance, is or uh, is that makes me want to go make stuff myself that may have nothing to do with it. But my, my dear, I have a dear friend, Joe Hunt is his name. He's a legendary jazz musician drummer. He says, don't call me a legend. They'll think I'm dead. But he's uh, <laughs> and he's still playing a little bit. They're going to start again this now at the yeah. the, lily, the lily pad in um, Inman Square. And in, in, I'm, uh, I'm taking lessons from him. We, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. So, you know, Joe. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I'll be at his house tonight. 
Okay. Say, say, what a wonderful connection. Yeah, um, what was I gonna say about Joe? Oh, that he, when he, that he plays at this little hole in the wall, the lily pad, it's a, I love it. Uh, he plays once a month. And Yuka, his, his, um, his wife is a wonderful pianist. Um, I went, I go see, I'm a groupie. I've been following Joe around for like 15 years, but I was at one show and it inspired me to, I made the, the two reliquaries that are tall sort of uh, black cones with a glass top on it. I'd made those, those sort of big trumpet forms a long time before. And when I, something in a Joe Hunt jazz concert remind me of, aha, I'll make a pair of reliquaries out of those. And then another time I went and they were playing something simple and beautiful. And I thought, Derek, you know, climb down from your high horse and just make something that's simple and beautiful sometime. And just, just celebrate Artemis, the wood goddess, you know? And so I made some simple, beautiful things. And one of them I traded to the fellow that gave, that I traded for a wonderful painting. So it's, you know, um, it's, it comes from various places. And certainly, you know, from music, from just, you feel part of that. That's what I always try to tell my students about. You know, there's a lot, I tell them the long story about when I went to, to visit a, the cave under prehistoric cave paintings in France. And um, the, so one with that Peche mural where there's the painted horses and they, they have the hand That's print cool. on the wall. And I, and I felt like you're high-fiving. I, 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 I swear I went to my knees and started to cry when I saw it. My son says that's not what happened, but um, I tell him it's my story. Um, <laughs> and he um, I just lost my image here. Um, but I felt connected to those folks. Like I said, when I was working on the face of that Shiger idol, idol, I was using a sharp metal chisel and stuff, but really thought, wow, I was like, we're in this together, you know? That's what I always tried to encourage my students to, to, to think about, that, you know, humans, we are capable, obviously, especially right now in Ukraine, we're, you know, capable of such monstrosities, you know? But we're also capable of wonderful stuff, you know? And it's really, you know, fun to be, feel like you're part of that tradition. I said, you know, that's, that's... That was the biggest lesson I would have for these kids, I think. It's also fun for us to listen to you sharing. Yeah. And, and uh, we, I, we thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, I've known you through science and spirituality, and it kind of puts it all together. Right. So glad yeah. you came and showed us that. Oh, thank you for the invitation. So it's yeah. good to see those. Some of you I know, and some of you have gotten to know, and some of you I'll know better, I guess. But I think next week I'm planning to go to church again. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 will you be, hello, will you yeah. be sitting in that special chair? <laughs> in his throne. Well, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room. I mean, maybe it's for social. I reasons. know it, but I could, <laughs> wouldn't recognize you as you're sitting there by me in the back. That's right. Well, anyway. thank you very much, Derek. This is really oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're, yeah. we're going to have thank to you. Come. And Mark, Mark, that's great. Say hi to Joe. All right. I will. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. And okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.